Hello everyone, this is Elisa Baum. I'm Percona's Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a minute, but first I'd like to conduct a bit of housekeeping. Could you please raise your hand using the hand icon in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me? And let's see, do I see hands? I see hands, thank you very much. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible, and those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on Percona's MySQL performance blog. In addition, I make sure that a recording of this webinar, as well as links to the slide, will be made available to everyone within 48 hours. I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar, MySQL and Geospatial Programming. It's being presented by senior consultant Michael Benshoof. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Michael. Go ahead, Michael. All right, thanks, Elisa. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so as you saw from the description, we're going to be talking a little bit about MySQL and Geodata today. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So what is Geodata? For those of you who aren't familiar with it, essentially it resolves around uh, geopositioning data, latitude and longitude coordinates, so anything that's kind of linked to your GPS or location services on your phone. And there are several different uh, facets of geodata that you can consider when you're looking at it. You can look at individual points, thinking of a, a single latitude, longitude coordinate. You can think about bounded areas, so a radius from a point. And you can also think about kind of defined areas. Um, where it's not necessarily a square or a circle, but it can be an actual polygon outline on a map. And when you combine, combine that with other functions of distance, um, you start to see a lot of potential. So what could we use geodata for? Some commonly asked questions that you would see when you think about geodata what are the, the five closest restaurants to my hotel for business travelers? Or how far am I from the airport? How many restaurants are within 25 miles? If I'm trying to pick a, a hotel, I want to make sure that there's a lot of things within walking distance. So these are all very common questions that you see now um, in apps and web services. And just, just thinking about that, as you know, I'm assuming people here have all enabled location services on their phone, so that's exactly what you can leverage to get asked these questions. And when you take that to other industries, you can think about oil and gas exploration, making sure that wells are in the proper location, meteorology, uh, that's a lot of, of geo uh, position data, logistics companies, so tracking travel and where trucks in a fleet are located and time on the road and all these sorts of things that need to be recorded, um, all of this can be managed using geodata. So the, the overall point is that geodata is out there and you're probably already using it in your companies and if not, likely you'll be integrating it at some point in the near future. So let's kind of look at the, the high level theory and formulas. I know this is everybody's favorite topic. So when you look at the distance between points, you can't necessarily look at it from just a flat, uh, flat surface. You need to look at it on a sphere because you're talking about geocoordination on the Earth. So to calculate that, we use the, the Haversine formula. And if everyone wants to you know, get out your calculators, you can see the lovely formula there to calculate that on the fly. Now, if we want to go ahead and actually translate that raw formula into MySQL, um, in older versions of MySQL prior to 5.6, you're going to be doing all this math on your own. And once 5.6 was released, which is the current stable release, uh, there's a new function included, ST distance, and there's some other ST functions that we'll talk about later, but these are now built in. So let's, let's look at an example and not talk just about the theory. So for this example, I took just a single latitude and longitude point and just changed the latitude by one degree. So looking at this, we've got our source lat and source long. And using this formula, which is known as the, the great circle distance formula for the Earth, we can see that the distance between those two latitude points on the same 
line of longitude is 69.09 uh, miles, which is what we're hoping for because the distance between two latitude lines is roughly 69 miles. So this shows that that formula can be used to calculate the distance between your points. So once we have that formula, we're able to kind of put this together with a, an actual table structure to leverage points and this distance formula. Because if you remember back towards the beginning, some of our more popular questions were find me things within this distance. So this structure here that I have up on the screen is kind of the, the standard older version of what a table structure would look like. And you have a, a latitude and a longitude column that are both decimals and a composite key that covers both of those fields. So if you also remember a couple slides back, we had that great circle distance uh, formula. So we've now made that into a function to just get a quick uh, snapshot of the distance in miles between two points using that formula. So combined with that table and this helper function, we can go ahead and take a source location, and I just took um, the Norman, Oklahoma post office, and grabbed the latitude and longitude of that and set my distance, and I found, sort of by distance, the uh, 10 closest uh, zip codes to what my current zip code is. And you can see that we use the 73071 zip code as my center, and it actually came back in that group as a distance of zero. So that's showing you that the, the actual distance is being calculated because you would expect my point is there and the distance between the point itself is zero. So let's look at some of the performance on that. It's not very good. And when you look at this, um, you can see in this explain that we're using a type all, which is going to be a full table scan. And you may ask, you know, why, why are we doing that? Because we were, you know, we had an index on our latitude and longitude coordinates. So this is where we have to bring more, more math in to actually handle the, uh, to handle it. Rather than look at, oh, I'm sorry, rather than look at our entire table, let's actually leverage that index that we created and limit it to a smaller bounding box. So when we look at the, uh, the bounding box principle, um, we're going to essentially create that square using our center latitude and longitude and then moving out that latitude um, line of, of the 69 miles. So you would create your lat one and uh, lat one and lon one and lat two and lon two coordinates and that would represent the actual full square. Then when you bring that back to your original query, you're able to go ahead and limit the part of the table that you're using. And as you can see, our query dropped from 0.8 seconds down to under a tenth of a second, or under a hundredth of a second. And that's where now we're actually able to use that index. So this is how things had been done using standard, uh, standard coordinates and a lot of math functions. Let's go and discuss the spatial data types now. So we already have reviewed our non-spatial way of indexing zip codes. Let's go ahead and convert that over to a spatial table. And the way that we're going to do that is take those decimal columns of latitude and longitude and recreate them into a single type called geometry. And the geometry type is where the spatial, where the spatial types are defined. And there are different types of geometry objects. You can have a point, you can have a polygon, you can have a line string, so thinking of that as a path. And starting in MySQL 5.7, which is uh, not quite released yet, and we'll talk about some of the, the benefits, um, you can also index on that geometry type. Um, currently in 5.6 and older, you can only add that index in my ISAM, but it has been added in, in 5.7. And we'll, we'll see how much of an impact that can make. So this is how our new table structure will look when we switch from the 
normal, or not normal, but the legacy version of latitude and longitude as individual columns and into a geometry type. Now keep in mind, as you can see on there, I have my geometry type and a spatial key with engine InnoDB. Um, I was doing a lot of this testing in 5.7 um, just to be able to show the impact of the spatial, spatial keys. So um, this query and this create statement would not work in uh, 5.6 because it does not support spatial keys. So that's just a disclaimer. So now if we go back to our original query that we had, we wanted to find um, zip codes that were um, around us. And so now we can use this new st contains function that you see. And what that is allowing you to do is leverage that geometry type and actually pass it a real point as opposed to having to use that bounding box. And now you're going to hit that index and that will find you the actual zip codes that you want for a particular point. So you may be saying, well, that's really great, but we've already had a query that just did that. And then when you look at the performance on this, the performance is actually the same um, looking at the, that bounding box versus this other version. So really kind of what's the benefit? And the main thing that we need to consider is that it can open up the opportunity to run several other uh, GIS geospatial based calculations. So let's take a look at some of that. Not just points. So in earlier slides, everything had been based off of a lat and long coordinate, which is which is good. We had we had access to that. That's a readily available um, database model. So when you look at a zip code, it's a it's a lat and lon. And generally, when you think of a, a waypoint or a location, you're going to be looking at a lat and lon. But in recent years, um, we have we've increased the uh, the use of the full polygon region and one example of this is the US Census provided schema and what that is and it's a freely available source um, it has all of the actual zip codes with uh, some additional subdivisions but rather than storing just a point it actually will store a geometry type so here is a look at the table definition that comes with that when you uh, download it and import it. And you can see on here we've got the shape of the geometry and the Z ZCTA 5CE10 um, is very intuitive and that is actually what the zip code would be. And so now let's look at the old version versus the new version. We've got in our sample that we put together we just have an actual point was the geometry type. But now that we've gone with the provided one, we have a full polygon version, which will allow us to actually take, you know, a more defined region as opposed to just saying, here is my point. Is this point equal to my point? Now I can say, is this point located within this region? So, I mentioned earlier that we had some GIS functions. We had that ST distance function. Um, now some additional functions that are offered are the ST contains and ST within functions. And there's a, a whole list of other additional functions that I, I won't go through here, um, but there's the, the link to where they would be. But these would give you all sorts of uh, geometric options. Um, so for ST contains, we're looking is an object within another object. So this is where you're thinking, okay, I have a point. Is that point within, uh, or does this polygon contain this point? Um, same thing uh, with within. Um, you can have a, a smaller region and a larger region, um, and say is my smaller region within my larger region. Um, there's things for line intersections. So a lot of the a lot of the possibilities open up when you have these uh, new new functions. So we're not just looking at a, at a straight distance between two points. We're now actually looking at um, geometry types, as, as they're called. So let's look at some sample queries now using our new zip code table versus the older table. So I wanted to find all of the zip codes, and I have a table of points of interest that are a group of points. 
and those are simply a point with an actual Latin alon because that's you know when you think of a point that's what that's what I want and so now I want to take that uh, table of points and join it against my zip code table and find out what zip code are all those points in and if you notice in that top query the st within function we're able to join on that and so because we're able to join on that function um, I can quickly get back, you know, the same way that you would join where, um, you know, lat equals and lon equals across the two tables. Now I'm able to use that function to say, um, find me everything where these are within. And so now I'm able to get back the actual zip codes attached to the individual points. And you can take that a step further and now say, okay, I need to find all of my, all the points within a certain zip code. And so now this is where we use the, the reverse, and I'm saying, show me all points that are there. So I'm using the ST contains, and I'm saying my shape polygon contains my point. And so, you know, compared to the, in contrast to the top, where I'm saying, show me where within my point is within my shape, now I'm saying where my shape contains the point, and it's finding everything. And these ST within, ST contains functions are returning a zero or one, which is why they're, uh, usable for, for doing these joins. And here's another one. Now you can take this another step further and say, okay, now I know all these counties that I have. Um, you know, I, I want to find all the zip codes in a county, and then I want to actually find all my points within a county as opposed to just a particular thing. So this is where you can start building, building this up. Now, um, in general, if I would take this table, you would make some modifications to that zip code table to have these counties and other pieces already attached to it, but this is just kind of showing you some of the, the potential that you have using, using this actual table as it is. So let's take a look at the actual impact of using the spatial key. So I talked earlier that it was not available in InnoDB until 5.7, and that's something that has kind of been talked about that has made um, using MySQL um, for geospatial functions rather limiting because generally you're going to want to use InnoDB. And uh, this next slide here, I'll show you the difference of what this key will make. So here's one of our earlier queries. This is one that we saw and it was finding all of my, um, finding all of the zip codes for an actual point. And we're using the st within function. So here are th this identical query um, against the same table with or without that spatial key. And you can see, you know, this, this has a major, major impact. I'm looking at four handler operations and my result coming back in under a hundredth of a second when I have my spatial key. And that spatial key, if we go back, I'll show you. That spatial key is around the raw dot shape from the zip code database. So that's where that spatial key is. And if you look at the, um, you know, pre-5.7 version of InnoDB, this query took over a minute to run and it had to scan the full table. Now, I'm not exactly using a powerful hardware for this so that one minute is probably misleading, but you can see the, the major difference there in the handler operations and the, the impact. And essentially what that's saying is I had to do multiple full table scans to go through and for each one of those points, I had to scan the whole table and find out is this point within this zip code. So after going through a lot of the theory, I wanted to work through some sample uses in, in kind of the real world as far as how, how you could use these, especially when you get to 5.7, because as I just demonstrated, in, in 5.6, InnoDB with geospatial functionality is really limited and, and not usable. So in trying to come up with some, some topics and, and some useful information, um, I grabbed one of our local um, readily available sources, and that is um, weather data, which, uh, you know, if anyone is from areas that are 
known for have severe storms, um, things that track weather are very important and readily available. So for this sample, um, every five minutes we post new observations of data, and that data also includes a um, all the sites which have the geographic information. And so what we're able to do then is we're able to take all of the raw CSV data and this, the raw observations that are linked to a specific uh, geo point, clean that data up and move it from a staging table into an actual recorded table and then actually use that data to query actual, you know, relevant, um, relevant data for what you're trying to look at. So now also there was a, an aside, there was an intermediate step that I ran one time that pulled that site information which had the Latin line and name of all the sites and it, it populated kind of a, a base table that had all the actual recording sites with their geographic information. So now looking back at some of our ST contains and our joins, I can now go back and say, okay, from all of my sites, find me all the sites that are within a certain county, and that's where I'm using um, I'm using that same SD contains join that I was using before. And again, this is where um, you could have also added the county to that table, so you wouldn't have to do this the the in clause there. But this was more for for demonstration. So as you can see, this came back and found me all the points that were there quickly. We're looking at under a hundredth of a second again. And then you can take that one step further um, as the uh, observations are done. One of the things that is observed is the air temperature. And so now I can take all of these and if you want to look and say, show me what my average air temperature was for all sites within a county, I can still use that same logic to find everything all based on the geodata and group that by where it is and get my averages so this is something that you could you could leverage to track other other things as far as miles driven in an area or, or that sort of thing and I wanted to bring it one step further and also in coming up with another example, um, something that is a, a very a very prevalent uh, geodata function is uh, parsing what's called GPX data, and I'm not sure how many people are familiar with GPX data, but um, when I was looking, you know, trying to come up with another sample of how to to use this information, I'm just kind of going through my phone and I found uh, there's an app that I use that's called MotionX GPS um, and what the app will let you do is you, know, you can record waypoints, you can record tracks, but one of the cool features that you can also use is that you can export your tracks in GPX format. And so when I think of a track, that would be recording a path that I took and this goes back to some of the things that we talked about earlier where your fleet management or your tornado tracks or anything like that, um, these are the types of things that you can record as a track. And a track should really just be thought of as, as a line string. So with that app that can export this GPX data, I wanted to tie this together with the MySQL functionality and try to come up with a, something that was useful or interesting. Um, to, to show how you can um, leverage that. So just trying to come up with an idea, I thought that it would be cool to start my phone when I, I started a drive and map out the, the points and then see how many miles I had driven in each zip code because I assumed that I would be moving through zip codes. So this is also going back to our original zip code table. And I, I know this is very, very exciting stuff, but it was trying to be something useful as far as finding uh, finding points and finding um, finding line strings as well. And again, we talked about some of the other possible uses, um, lo logistics tracking, pipeline, tornado tracks, um, anything that really is a actual trip that you wanted to follow. 
So this is a, a sample from what a GPX file would look like. And thinking into the, the translation um, to the database side, each one of these points within the actual track is, has a latitude and a longitude and elevation and a timestamp. So this really allows us to, to do a few things. We can take that data and store it in the database with the Latin lawn as an actual point. We can also take that time into an index time column. So now we can actually order by our time and get all of our points and really see um, over time where we are located. And so I wanted to, to show you this was part of the core code um, and this was something um, coming from a little bit of a development background. Um, I often like to do a lot of things in code as opposed to the database. It's one of those just because I can use the database to do this math and this logic, it sometimes isn't the best place. So there are some libraries in Python that I used for this that will allow you to take one of those GPX files and parse it. And once it's parsed, I now have access to each one of those track points that I showed you. And I can do some of this work in in my actual application as opposed to just doing it all in the database and then use the database for the actual the joins that I want to I want to actually follow as opposed to just trying to do all the all the raw math so this goes through and as you can kind of follow the the, the pseudo code there and I've, I've omitted some some things just for, for brevity um, I'm taking each one of those points and I'm converting it to the string of what that point would be with the, the longitude and latitude and also the time. And now if you look down at my, my bulk insert, um, essentially what I'm doing is each one of those points, I am inserting it, but I'm wrapping it with the geom from text function, which is what you use as you're storing things um, in geometric format. What that allows you to do is define your object as a point, and the geom will store it as the actual binary object, which is not readable. Um, I don't know if anyone noticed earlier in the presentation where I had the as text, but if you actually want to look at what a geom point represents, um, you would select the as text function around that field. And so this is the, the inverse of that, and this is how you would store uh, a string as an actual geometric function. So I have all these points and I'm translating them from something visual into that and this allows me to do that using a uh, bulk insert and that is going to be the, the geom from text. So now once I have all those points in there and I've converted everything from a raw latitude and longitude to a, ge a geometry object, I can go back to that original query that we had that will join the points table against the zip code table and find the zip code that contains the individual point for each one. Now, if you look down through some of this code, and again, I, I've omitted some just for, for space and, and formatting. Um, I don't know if you see it towards the bottom, I have the vicinity function, and that's something that comes from one of the, the Python libraries that I was using. In MySQL, you would be able to actually calculate the, the length between two points, and this is one of those decisions where, yes, it is possible and you, you can do it, but it didn't make as much sense. So since we had um, an application library that could handle that distance, it didn't make sense to use the CPU power of our database to do all those calculations. When I have my full list of points and I can take those two points and using the CPA, uh, CPU of my app server, which, you know, thinking of a standard architecture, we've got multiple app servers going against a single database. I can do those calculations outside. So really what I'm using the database piece for in this sample is to do that join and to convert the, the raw points to where they are within a polygon and find out which polygon they are, they're all in. So this doesn't necessarily have to it can be zip code. This could be if I have multiple parcels of land 
and I know that I have um, several individual points that are located across that, this could be something where I could map and find out a count of how many pieces were in each parcel or um, you know cell towers within a state or anything like that so this was this is where you can take those those raw points and find out are they in uh, this larger polygon so after that query runs and after the application runs um, we get back some results and that was using that and using that vicinity function that we saw there it was calculating the the distance between each one of those points that were within a certain MySQL geometry region and was just doing some addition as they ran through and keep, kept track of all that now when I was working through this I also used the same um, the same structure but just to see the impact again of the spatial key I ran this same function but joined against that zip code table without an actual key on the shape field and the timing went from roughly a tenth of a second to calculate the entire distance of the whole trip to orders of magnitude higher in the 20 to 30 minutes I actually ended up killing it because it never completed but it, it shows you how with 5.7 with the ability to add that indexing um, you're able to really get usable results in a usable time frame because without that I mean, no one can really run that function and expect it to run for 30-45 minutes um, you expect something like that to come back quickly and that's what the, the additional additional indexing and then the enhancements that have come out in 5.7 will allow you to do. So I think that's that's pretty much what I have for, for this. Um, I'll send it back to Elisa and if we want to have some questions we can we can go with that. Hi Michael, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. There's a there's a question from the audience that I'm not quite sure how to read. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste it into the chat window for okay. you. So let me go ahead and do that. And if you wouldn't mind uh, re rephrasing it and answering it, that would be great. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and send that to you. Okay. Were you able to see that? Yes. Okay. Um, as far as the, the interface, so the, the, the question is using the, the GeoJSON um, documents. I don't believe um, there is an actual um, easy interface for that from the, the MySQL standpoint. Um, there, there, may, there may be. Um, that'd be something that I can, I can review and get back. But um, for actually storing that, you're gonna you're gonna look at your your as text, and that's gonna give you back what the actual um, what the type is and the all and the actual um, contents of the type. So when you when you do that as text, um, it will say that this is a this is a point, and here are the the actual coordinates in it. If that if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, in, in 5.6, is using my ISAM a risk for table corruption for GEO? Um, yes, so when, when we say the table corruption, that's more of just a, a, a general my ISAM use case where it's not recommended to use my ISAM because you do have the, the non-durability that you would see in NODB. Um, so you know, while it is possible, and depending on what you're doing, I mean, if these are all staging tables that are going to um, exist and then be removed, I've seen people do that, where they're uh, creating my ISAM tables kind of on the fly that, that can leverage the um, leverage the spatial types or spatial indexes. Um, that that would be one approach. But as far as the long-term data, you know, as we would generally recommend that you're using NODB for that. Um, yeah, you would you would run the risk of, of corruption by storing your your data in a my ISAM table just to, to use the the 
spatial indexes, which is why the, the 5.7 release is so exciting for when it goes GA because this will remove that limitation um, and actually keep your keep your data in NODB as recommended. Okay, great. What types of spatial indexes exist? Um, not really. When, when you ask about the, the spatial indexes, it's more just a, a spatial type of, of, of index, so you wouldn't necessarily give a different spatial index. You would you would use the spatial index on an actual ge ge geometric field, excuse me. Um, so there's not really a different uh, a different type per se, but you can use that on the different geometry types. Does that does that make sense? Okay, the person that asked the question, if you want to just elaborate um, or let me know if, if you need more, that would be great. Okay, so the next question is um, one of the one of the the questions is um, if it would be possible to make the Q dumps of the database used in the examples um, ready or available. Um, I can post uh, I can post some instructions. I don't know as far as whether we can actually provide the full um, actual dump file, but there is a, a pretty readily available process that I can post in in a follow up. And I think one of my colleagues also may have documented the the process um, in a previous blog post as well. But that's something I can post in a follow up as far as um, getting that stuff converted from the raw census data into an actual um, MySQL format, and there are there are some steps. It uses some other other tools to do that conversion, um, and uh, that would be how we could do that. And uh, there's a possibility, and, and if it is possible, um, I might be able to provide what that actual census database um, looks like, just in an actual SQL dump format. Um, so again, I'll, I'll follow up with that in a, in a follow up post. Okay, great. Um, can can you explain how to use Polygon in MySQL 5.6? So when you when you look at the the Polygon function, what that's going to be is the the Polygon is defined by all the points in its border. So this is where um, similar to that last demo that I was showing where I said I wanted to do an insert with a geom from text with a point, you would use that same logic and you would say I want to you know, insert and geom from text, but then I would do the string of a polygon. And the string of the polygon would just be each one of the points in the border of that polygon in order and basically starting and ending with that first point to make a complete uh, enclosed shape and that would be the string that you would pass that geom from text, and it would know that you're using, um, and it would be stored then as a polygon. Does that answer the question? Okay, the poser of the question, just let me know if that works for you. All right, so the next is, can you talk about geo-indexing using bounding box R trees? Um, when, uh, so are you just... Uh, for, for clarification, just just talking about the the minimum uh, the minimum bounding rectangle is that what we're you're, you're wanting to, to talk about as far as how how that sample worked? Okay, I'll wait to hear from the the person who asked the question on that one, and we'll go to the next one. Um, a comment from the audience: Five seven now supports GeoJSON. It also now has the ST distance sphere function, and he provided a link for more information, which I'll share with you, um, and you can post it in the follow-up blog post. Okay, thank you very much, audience. Um, next question, um, can we go from MySQL 5.7 in production environment to get the benefit of Geo? Um, right now, I wouldn't recommend that until it's generally available. Um, as one of our audience members pointed out, there's a, additional functions that are already coming online. Um, when I uh, worked through some of these samples, I was using an older um, development snapshot. Um, so while it, while it is possible, I definitely don't really recommend using anything that's not uh, GA status in production. Um, now, again, this, this is depending on what the, the data is. If it's not critical data or it's you know temporary parsing of things, 
maybe that would be something that's okay. But as far as actually using that for your, your core production um, storage, that would make me a little bit hesitant. All right, next question. What is the implementation of the spatial index? Is it an R tree index or a question mark? I would need to check on that and get back to you. I'm not sure offhand. Okay. Next question. When using full text, the full text index is always used before any other indexes. Does spatial do likewise? Um, the two of those can actually be combined, and I, I can post a link to a, a sample where you can actually, on your same table, have your, your spatial index and also a full text indexed, um, and I've seen that used very nicely as far as um, combining the two. Um, now, as far as what's in there, you can only put, obviously, you can only put geometric types in a spatial index, so that's where some of the composite indexing will break down. Um, as far as the, the order and saying which one it would use, um, that would be something that um, I would need to, to verify as far as if it would ensure that everything else was thrown away. I guess it really would depend on, on how you're doing the join and, and how you're trying to, to use that index, if that, if that makes sense. But that's something that I can look at and follow up with. All right, next question. Are there any preliminary performance or scalability metrics on the spatial functionality? For example, how will MySQL 5.7 compare to MongoDB? spatial functionality from a performance and scalability perspective? There are none that I can think of offhand, but I'm sure there have been some posted. That's something that I can look to see if there's any other any other data available or if there's, um, you know, internally if we have any other metrics for that or, or externally. So that's something that I can also have in the follow-up. But there's none that I, I have particularly offhand that compares it to other, other um, applications. Okay, next question. Is spatial assuming a flat world, or does the distance function use great circle distance? Um, so you can add the different uh, spatial reference types, um, and those are going to be defined in your actual um, in your in your actual database that's there. So that's part of um, like when you import the the zip code database, it also includes the the um, SRID type, and those can be um, the, your various um, your various positioning systems, and that's what those are um, those are used with. Um, so, by by doing those calculations, you you are assuming a a flat um, a flat plane, but it is. I'm trying to think how to word this appropriately. It is um, going to match um, what that, um, it's called the SRID, which uh, identifier um, you're using for that system. Okay, um, that's the end of the question so far. Does, I'll give everyone a couple more seconds. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted to remind everybody that I will be sending you a link to both the recording and the slides within 48 hours, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, in addition, all these questions will be sent to Michael after the show, and he'll be able to address them on a blog post on the MySQL Performance blog. Uh, so, Michael, I think that's it for questions today. I'd like to thank you for a really great show, and audience, I'd like to thank you for attending. Um, Everyone have a wonderful day, evening, or morning, depending on where you're calling from. And Michael, thank you again. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon.